So this is the agenda. I will start talking just a little bit about FECAP, the institution I have been teaching since 2003. Then I will talk a little bit about uh, technology and education. I will go, I will try to bring a different vision, the vision of engineering. Morning in progress. And then we'll move forward to talk a little bit about adoption, talk about AI, AI adoption, and I'll present some model that I have created. And I'll try to share some takeaways, some personal takeaways uh, that I, I took from the work I have been doing to see if we can have a nice discussion. Uh, well, FECAP is a private institution. It's a foundation, non-profit. It was created over 120 years ago uh, from an endowment from Alvarez Pinchato family. Uh, the focus uh, was business and economics, but in the last decade, we have been opened up for in a new field like computer science and so on. Uh, FECAP is a very interesting institution. Uh, it's a small institution, not well known, but in terms of results, and it's something that I have been proud of, in the last 20 years, we have created two programs that help to develop FECAP, develop the students and the professors. The PDP, that's the program de educação uh, progressiva, contínua progressiva, dinâmica progressiva, is targeting students. And basically what we do is we, every Saturday we have a full-time uh, education to help students, most of them came from public institutions, to catch up, to learn or to fill the gap in terms of education, to have what they need to make most of the college experience. And also we created the uh, PKD, that's a program that helps professors to develop, to teach better, to share better experience to those students. And what is interesting that most of the students uh, that are in FECAP came from public schools, most from low-income families. If you compare the ratio of uh, low, the, the low in FECAP, most of them are from low-income fa uh, families compared to FGV and to INSTA. Uh, but the results in FECAP are pretty good. So if you see the standard, the, the INAP evaluation, for many years, we are reaching the same level FGV in business and economics. Uh, that's quite impressive. But one day, hopefully I can share our experience. It's not the, the goal today. So moving forward, I would like to invite you to have a broader vision about technology. We can consider technology uh, something that's broader that sometimes we're considering now. We are used to say, let's use technology in school. And uh, we think about novel technology, cutting edge technology, high tech. But if we think about technology as any process, technique, or tool we use to accomplish a goal, we can expand our vision and take a bro that broader vision to, to some analysis. So if we think about that uh, or consider that way, uh, even when we learned how to paint on the cave wall, we could consider technology. And since there, we have the ability to share ideas, to teach others. Okay, and when we think about that, or if we think that way, we have been using technology to mediate uh, the learning for a long time. And then a new technology was created, one that I love, and I love even the smell of the technology. That's the book. Uh, I don't think there was any other technology that has impact that much education, that has spread the word and helped to create educated people. I like this one minute video that I'm going to share that has a, a better definition what a, a book is. It's from Carl Sagan. What a, what a, what a huge thing. thing. Oh, but one glance at it and you're inside the mind of another person maybe somebody dead for thousands of years across the millennia an author is speaking clearly and silently inside your head directly to you writing is perhaps the greatest of human inventions, binding together people who never knew each other, citizens of distant epochs. Books break the shackles of time. A book is proof that humans are capable of working magic. It's an amazing technology for teaching, for learning. However, it's probably one of the hardest technologies to learn. 
and I don't need to worry about that. It takes a long, a lot of years to learn how to extract the maximum from wood. So, and we have seen the results. So people don't learn easily how to reach, or even if we consider they know how to reach, they don't understand. And when we think about adoption of a new technology, we are not in the place we would like to be in terms of teaching people how to learn, how to reach. Uh, let's use the technological view or the engineering view about technology adoption. So any adoption, if we consider the number of adopters over time, follows a, a pattern like this, an S-shaped curve. So it starts slowly and people start to learn and you get more adopters of any technology, even a group. And then you have like an acceleration, that some traction, it goes up until you reach a plateau. It doesn't mean that 100% of the population is using that technology, but it means that something is holding back other people to move on or to learn the technology or to adopt the technology. And can we move that plateau up? Yes, we can. And technology companies have been doing that successfully. I just took a chart to the adoption of unit sales of as a proxy of computers. And I plotted where I put those arrows to show when a new Windows version was launching. So if you see here, uh, I'll probably try to use my, oh, they will not see. <laughs> so basically if you see every few years, you have like a small S shape. Sometimes it's really spread. And if, when it's reaching a plateau, if I could zoom in here, you could see, there is a new version, Microsoft launched a new version of Windows. Then they have a new S shape here, reaches a plateau. It's not selling anymore. They launch a new version, then Windows 3, then Windows 95, it should be up here. There's a plateau here and then a new S shape and so on. For all technologies, when you reach a plateau, what do they do? They try to understand the factors that are preventing people to adopt. It's like a bottleneck. You find and identify those factors and then you, work on that in your product, you design better product, and then you can basically move the plateau up. I mean, the people in Zoom are saying that they can see our notes. Okay. <laughs> and uh, not the, the presentation like as a whole. So if you go to share and you uh, can share yeah. the presentation part. Maybe stop. Share. Stop. And maybe start sharing again. Yeah. Start sharing again. Only the presentation. Here? Not the full screen. Okay. Can they see? And no, 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 just no, click side show. Click side show. Click side show to the left. I think it will be better soon. No, no, no. Just where is this? You were in this slide, right? Yes. But I, yeah, it's full there, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. You got it there? Yeah. Uh, no. But I cannot do anything here. Uh, if it escaped to lead the, the presentation, we can Maybe. It's extended, not the In the oh, yeah. It keeps going so, back. Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why. Yeah, they're changing the form. Yeah. Okay, now it's just back, right? Yeah. Can, can you check? No. Mm -hmm. no. Uh, yeah, no, it's no. Not. No, no, no. Okay, okay. okay. it's just a yeah, so, Okay, so let's move on. Uh, it's very interesting. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's technology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the Koreans uh, realized that that sometimes it's hard to make everyone adopt a new technology. In this case, uh, Si Jong, the great king, wanted people to learn how to reach and to write. And he realized that only rich men were able to do that because they used the Chinese characters. And Chinese characters, you can, you, we have, or actually they map it over 103,000 characters. But you can speak Chinese if nowadays the modern Chinese, if you know, from 3,000 to 4,000. And he realized that it would be impossible for a large adoption. And then in 1443, he proposed the Hangul, that's the new alphabet. 
phonetic, very simple. There is a logic behind, anyone could learn. He published the Hong Jin, Hong Jin Zhang Zhang in 1914 of 46. That's the proper sounds of, for education of people. And in his own words, that's not so politically correct nowadays. A wise man can acquaint himself in before the morning is over, but uh, and a stupid man can do that in 10 days. So anyone can learn how to. And it's very interesting the approach because they realized that it was so hard Instead of trying to push people towards learning something that's hard, they said, let's simplify that so everyone can have access to that. It's a different approach, and it looks like that works. You can see how Koreans deal with uh, all the disciplines of PISA, standardized tests, they do pretty well. So can we improve book adoption? In my opinion, yes. I'll just share a quick experience here. But I start to teach uh, management uh, theory in FECAP. That's how you start to give class for management uh, uh, to group. And it's very interesting because most of the students were working for the full day and they arrived very uh, sometimes late to the class. And then there was a book that looks like a Bible. It was not so, the feature of that book that was amazing in terms of content was not good for them. And then we, refought, we thought, can we create something better? I and colleagues create another book. We leverage a lot of the simplification using QR codes to access content uh, online, uh, listen to small podcasts that we basically explain in two minutes or three minutes what's going on because they were get, they were spending one hour, two hours on a bus. They could hear that. And we re realized 10 years ago that people, the young people were using uh, WhatsApp most of the time. So that it was the interface they were used to read. So if you ask them to read a book, they will not read the book. But if you ask them to stay three hours in front of WhatsApp, they read. So we, we every by the end of every chapter, we design it. Uh, uh, we create two characters that discuss about uh, the, the content of the chapter. Like the my boss asked me about that. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what to, how to talk about that. And then the girl would explain him. We use a lot of uh, emoticons. And the feedback was great, a critical review. Some uh, authors did a critical review and said that the book contributes a lot. So they measured that and they said that students are learning that. So there is a lot of room to do. And it's what I want to share before moving on to AI. When we try to rethink adoption, at least from an engineering perspective. That's a picture of the first computer I got. I saw the first computer when I was nine years old. I, for every day after I saw, I asked my parents for a computer was very expensive, my parents couldn't afford. After two years, now I understand because every day my daughter asks for something, I go and buy because I don't wanna keep hearing that. My father decided to sell a landline phone that was a property, an asset in Brazil. You could live from that. He sold our landline phone and uh, he bought a computer. And I think it was a great decision. Why? Because I, I loved that thing. I, I said, this would change everything. I learned how to code. And the first thing I realized, I could call small games to share, to help people to learn. And when I was 13 years old, I was invited to be a co-author of this book that you see. And we created a few games using BASIC and I shared with students, I shared it. There was no internet, what you used was a, a, a tape to share that program and people liked it to use. And then I thought, wow, that's easy to make you things better in education, and I was wrong. So there's a lot of evidence that computers by itself does not help, does not improve learning. Of course, it depends the way you use the computer. And it's not just about buying computer. This week we had a meeting with a, a public, a, a, how can I say, a countryside school in Brazil, north uh, west of Brazil. And uh, it's a very interesting project that they wanna run and they said, the problem is not computer. We have an amazing computer. In fact, we are tired of buying Ferraris, but the Ferrari State Park, no one uses the Ferrari. What I have I, I realized before I move on to AI is that we are we have been uh, we pretend people or we believe people will use a technology in a way and people use another way, and that's what drove me to understand the factors that really uh, help people to adopt the technology. And if you go back to the history, 
Uh, I would like to share this screen. This is a typical picture from the Industrial Revolution. And the reason I'm sharing this is because in the Industrial Revolution, and I want to do an analogy here, uh, it was ignited by the steam engine. So basically all the, the manufacturing plants had a huge steam engine outside the manufacturing plant because they were burning coal full time. And the energy was being transmitted by this axle here. And those axles here would go through the whole plant and sometimes would, would go through other buildings. So all the buildings aligned and everything, all the architecture was designed around these, those axles. All the machines should be put in a way they could access those axles by those belts and get the movement so they could automate. And then the electric energy came and electric motors came. And that's funny what I'm going to tell, but it's so interesting when we see, we look back to the history and you see that sometimes things re are repeating. Uh, it took 100 years to realize how to use electric motors here. The first thing people try to do is get a big electric motor, a huge one, put or replace the steam machine. That's the thing that made sense. Let's put electric motor. It never, the entrepreneurs that tried that never saw the money back. Why? Because electric motors were very expensive, especially huge ones, and the electric fuel was pretty expensive. So if you want to get a sense of that, you get your, electric, your energy bill multiplied by 100, and that's what you would pay. It took 100 years to realize that the idea, the technology changed in a way that you don't need those axles to distribute the energy. You put small electric motors that are very cheap inside each machine, and then you distribute through wires. But no one thought about that because although electric small steam engines existed, you would never use that because otherwise you would have a nightmare in terms of logistics. A lot of people bringing coal, burning coal here, all the steam here, it, it, it would be a mess. My, why it took 200 years? It's a long conversation, but it's very interesting. There are even papers, a nature paper interesting about how it's really hard to change our mindset. I, in my opinion, in my impression, that's the same thing that's happening in all this. We have amazing technologies, and we're trying to force in an old framework. We're trying to say, this is how it should be and how should people should use, and it's not happening. It may will take long time. Uh, sorry for interrupting, sure. but in this case, isn't the case that a human labor is cheaper than technology? In a, it's, it's cheaper for me to just pay less for 10 people uh, moving the machine instead instead of, of paying for uh, a new engine and new technology. Well, they tried. That, I, I agree with you. It's a very good point. And then when I saw that, I, start, I tried to research. And the context I saw that's because of the digital transformation. Mm -hmm. And it looks like people tried hard. And there was a big pressure because there was a, the background was a big battle between two platforms. The oil as a platform to run the world or electric energy. And there was a a, a, a amazing competition. That's an interesting answer. So there was a big push, even subsidies to try, incentives to try, because they wanted to create this new uh, platform. But changing the paradigm or the paradigm shift is, is, very, uh, is very hard. I mean, how we teach in a classroom, it's more or less the same that we have been doing for many years. That, and But people change it. As, as I said, for example, the book I used to teach, it was the same book. They only put new, more uh, 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 pictures, but it, it, the feature for the new generation was not so good. I, I love books. I love that book. The content is even deeper than the book I published, but people, they just don't want it. So my, my I'm, what I'm, look, look, I would like to share, and it's a personal thought here, is like, I believe that we are in the same situation now. We are trying to push technology in our old framework, in our old vision. And uh, I don't know why I keep using this, but let's see. <laughs> How people use, during the, the pandemic period, uh, government in Brazil tried to give cell phones, internet access, um, in Escola Politecnica that I'm close, people gave computers. And what people did with the computer, or at least the teenagers. That's a study I'm running with a large sample. What they are, were doing? 
or what they are doing most. They are playing games. Almost 80, it doesn't matter the school I target, almost 80% of the young guys are playing games. And now and they are playing games inside the classroom and they're competing. They set up competitions inside the classroom while in the engineering school or in the business school and they're playing games. And the frequency that happens is much more on the higher side on the left side. I have data that's not a goal here, but my point here, I can share that I'm going to publish or I try to publish. But the thing is, we think people use the technology in a way that they use the way they want. They believe that. And why games is so easy to use? That, that's a cover of my thesis in MIT. I was advised by Robert Pindike. And what I studied there is game or home console game platform competition. I want to understand from the microeconomic perspective, the adoption of the of gaming and it was very interesting how good they are and that's why it's so easy to make someone to play games and it's harder to do other things uh, it's pretty interesting and that was the trigger for what i'm going to speak today in 2013 i published that and we predicted how things would change and what would be the future of game and then six years later Google launched Stadia that has online platform that you can play on any device. And now I, I was really happy. It was the first time that I saw that a model could be useful to predict the future. Pindax, my advisor sent me emails acknowledging that we could predict that six years in advance. And he said, send your email to Google to start with your cheeses to see what they talk about. Maybe they have read your cheese. But let's go to artificial intelligence. Uh, because I realized that models can help us to somehow predict what's going to happen, I started to apply artificial intelligence to do that. But what is artificial intelligence? A systematic literature reveal in 2003 found over 1,000 definitions of artificial intelligence. I will just adopt here a broader vision. Artificial intelligence is a science or is a science field that uh, seeks the development of computer software that can exhibit intelligence or can mimic humans or animals in their cognitive process to address an issue. And that's a broader vision of artificial intelligence. It's not a new field. It has, it has been around as a field for at least 70 years. And computers have been learning since then. But the difference now and what changed now is how computers learn. In the past, if you want to uh, uh, the computer to learn how to play chess, you would hire an expert, a chess player, to explain all the chess game rules and to explain the best strategy or the strategy he would use to win the game. He would explain that to a software developer, the software developer would encode those rules using computer language, and the computer would learn. And then you would have a game. But the, what happened is that the computer, despite the power, how powerful was the computer, he would be restricted or constrained to how good was a chess player and how good was a software engineer. So it doesn't matter if you have a supercomputer, it would be constrained by how powerful was the, were the humans giving the instructions. And what changed since the 80s, new type of algorithms start to be created. That's what we call machine learning. So machine learning basically is the development of some techniques or algorithms that makes the computer learn from the data, extract rules from the data, encode those rules, and then you can use those models for whatever you want. So now what's changed is the computer is not restricted anymore to our knowledge or the, but we have limitations to do with data, with data at the same time. But the computer can look through the data and the five patterns extract rules, and we can use those rules. That's a small example. It's an old example. How powerful this can be. This is an old game. Uh, by the way, there is an entrepreneur on the gaming industry in the past. So probably only us played Atari in the past. This is an old game. Atari. <laughs> he developed, uh, uh, Andre Nudeman had a company that created game consoles in Brazil, right? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't my company, but uh... you invest. <laughs> so 
Uh, this is old game. Uh, in this old game, basically, you need, uh, what they did is they put AI to play the game. Unfortunately, let me see if I can hide here. <laughs> well, but the computer is not playing well. And the only thing they did is ask the computer to play that game. They never encoded the rules. They only asked the computer, you need to maximize the number of points. After two hours, and here we, you cannot see because it's hidden, the bar is hidden, or it's hiding, uh, it plays like an expert. And it's very interesting how fast it learns. If you compare to a human that never played a game, computer learns by itself much faster without any rule encoding. Uh, I think you stopped at the video, right? Good question. Yes, sure. It learned by iteration. Uh, iteration. Like it it's, tries a lot of times. And it that's can. it. It's yeah. a reinforcement learning here. So basically, and but the, 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 what's interesting is after four hours, it realized that there is a strategy. So it creates some, how an abstraction of the knowledge. It realized there is a strategy for maximizing the chance of winning the game. It, 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 if it's able to direct the ball to one place and creates a tunnel, the ball will be kicking on the top, so it will maximize. And if you get that algorithm that learned that game and put to play a, a distinct game with another architecture, it learns faster than an algorithm that never played a game, like a game. So computer can quickly catch up what humans do, depending on the field in very specific tasks. But what I believe that's interesting and we still and what I'm seeking to use in education uh, are things like this. So sometimes we don't, we cannot see things that a computer find. And this is one example. Let's consider two group of people. Uh, some people have at least during the day, the average charge level of their, the battery of their cell phone, they are at least 45%. And the other group we found here, the average battery level is less than 26%. You don't need to tell me, but I would like you to, to think about which group you are. What uh, This is a real case from financial sector where I do most of the, my job. Um, and then I try to apply those things in education. But what we have learned, this tells something about people. It tells, for example, that people on the left side, the people that keep their mobile phone charging, have the probability of not paying their credit card or their debt or being a default, less than 34%. And what I learned is at least for that company, there, people that uh, are on the right side here, the group that does not charge the battery, have the probability of being a default up, uh, higher than 78%. Why? I don't know. Maybe this tells something about how people uh, manage their life, if they have money to buy a better phone, we don't know why, but the fact is we tried that, we proved that hypothesis in for that population it works. Combine it to other metrics you collect from cell phone, and that's why the amazing presentation we did last week, I was online, sorry to could be here. It's very important, the top keywords tackle. So what do we do with data and who is doing and doing what? And the, in, the, in this specific case, banks were collecting data about the level of the better. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I will give one example. You don't need to tell how much money you make, but we collect data about the apps installed. And I know, for example, that you have been uh, using the Uber Drive app for the last 10 months or the last eight months for at least uh, eight to 10 hours a day. So I know that you make 5,000 reais, 5,000 yeah. on the average. So that's how easy it is to give credit. You know the stickiness to an app, how much time you use. And I know, for example, you start to see consulta CPF, consulta Serasa. That's a flag that something is not good. And then you start to install app and get credit in many places. So uh, if we could discuss here what we know from people about what they do online, we predict the future. We know six months in advance, a guy that's paying everything, the credit card, we know six months in advance he'll be in the fall, but he'll, he'll, he'll have a, a debt in the future. That tells me that's about behavior and that kind of knowledge can be applied to education in a good sense. So why not using in education? I believe that we should use, and that's what I'm trying to do. It's not easy 
to not the technology itself, but the, the human side of the equation, dealing with institutions and things like this. But one of the things that I like about AI, despite uh, I, I'm running a big research about how professors, uh, students, teachers are using ChatGPT, but not that that's not the top to the, the top here is we can predict things. And I like to do a, 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 to share why prediction is important. It's the same analogy that I use with companies and I like to use with institutional education institutions. Let's suppose I split here into two groups and I'll have two groups and I give to each group $10,000. And I ask, I say, this is a game, each group will have $10,000. And in the next five years, you will use your knowledge the best you can to uh, make this money, uh, to invest that money and make the most of that. So we are talking about investment, making decisions to do the best with the constrained resource you have. I don't know which group is going to win, but if I give to, let's suppose group A, a small crystal ball, it's not a perfect crystal ball. It's just a, something that tells a little bit about the future. Sometimes you'll see sharp image, but that's rare. Most of the time you see a blurry image, but it gives like some idea where the future is going or how it's going to be. So if I give to one group a small crystal ball, and that we prove it by doing research, that small, that group will perform better. We won't perform the other group. Because when you have something that tells a little bit more about the future, you have a little bit more information, you make more informed decisions. You reduce the risk profile of your decisions. And that can be applied to business and can be applied to government, can be applied to educational institutions. And that's why I believe that's important to use that capability of predicting in large, in the context of large scale education. Um, without, uh, let's say, ignoring the fact that who should do that, how it should be done in the context of the day. So one of the things we can predict is school dropout. So we can ahead detect that and you can act. So every time you know something is going to happen, you can put your resource, even if it's constrained, in the direction to try to avoid something. Another thing is the performance, is student performance. And it, this is a, a, a actually one of the predictors of the school dropout, but we can also predict this school, the student's performance. We can know ahead if a student will pass or fail. Uh, there are a lot of studies and published papers and people creating models. And the big thing is adoption. And I love this picture because a company that makes robots to mop the floor, that became viral. Someone took the picture of the employee cleaning old fashioned. So it's adoption. <laughs> How you change people's behavior? I'm talking a lot of beautiful things here. We can change the world and then, okay, let's do it old, old fashioned way. And I start to try to understand that. I did a research, I interviewed 43 people. It's a qualitative research. And then I raised the hypothesis, what factors help people to adopt AI. And then I run, I test my hypothesis in over 306 organizations, including educational institutions. And what we found, one thing, of course, we need to group the factors. We can explode in many factors here. But the extent that people believe all the facilitating conditions for them to use the technology, AI are there. If they believe everything's there, oh no, I need to call someone, ask the password, and then I need the manager to give me authorization, and then I need a new computer, forget, people will not use. People want to do three clicks, four clicks and use. Um, especially because they will use something else, it's something on the top of the pile they need to do every day. They need to learn that, and then you create a lot of bureaucratic work they will not use. The second thing, and this higher the perception of facilitation conditions available, higher the behavior intention. I will not put the coefficients here, but I can share all the references there. But, um, the extended people believe the performance of the two combined to their work work. How that tool is going to improve my performance? The tool is good. If I use that tool, I will do better. I will do faster. My boss will like. 
I will deliver my mission better. If they believe that, they will have higher adoption intention. The effort I need to put to learn that technology. If they believe the effort is high, they will, that will reduce or diminish the adoption intention. If they believe the effort is really actually, in fact, is really low, they want to adopt. So far, other models have found that. But the difference here is we found that what mediates is the social influence. So social influence has an important role here. So if everyone is using ChatGPT, I need to use ChatGPT. Three people came to me and said, if I have used, I haven't used yet. It doesn't matter because I'm feeling stupid. I need to use. So that plays some influence here. And what is, was, was novel here is we thought that self-efficacy also played an important role. Self-efficacy was created by Bandura, a Stanford professor that unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And it's related to how, if I believe that I can master that specific behavior. It doesn't matter if the tool is amazing, easy, people want me to use. Internally, do I believe I'm good in math? I believe that I can do that. If I believe that I can perform that, I will do. If I don't believe, despite all those other factors, it will lock me. Oh, I'm not good in math. And then forever I'll say I'm not good in math. That works for AI adoption as well. And higher the behavior intention, of course, higher the behavior. Uh, so, of course, we can unfold on many factors. We grouped here, facilitate condition, and so on. But that drove me my research because I wanted to uh, help universities and, and colleges to use that because I can see how we, amazing things we can do with AI. We have been doing that for many years in for financial institutions, and what I was doing was only helping them to make more money. Why not help you? The education system that I believe that will create a better future. So, what's going to happen if I have a new tool that has amazing facilitation position, people perceive as an amazing uh, tool, um, the performance, people believe the performance of their job with that tool will be much higher, the effort is much low, they believe they can master the, the use of that tool and the social influence because a lot of people believe that will be high. But what is going to happen, the behavior intention of adopting will be high and the behavior will be high. Uh, so people will use. And what, what tool was that? ChatGPT. So when I start to use that framework, I, I, we could predict what's going to happen. By the end of 2021, I wrote this report that was published by Singularity University in 2022. And we predict, I said, in 2022, we'll see amazing things that the new language, large language models will make. And people, and if you see the whole text, we talk a lot about things, and we even predict what's going to happen during this year. That's based on combining, creating hybrid models that will do things that we believe that would be 10 years ahead. Um, then I start, this, this article will be published this week by MIT Sloan Review in Brazil, but that starts to be used as a framework in some consulting I am doing, and I start to guide my research, and I will share a little bit about the things I'm trying to do to improve those factors so uh, I can uh, help the education institutions to do the adoption in large scale. So one thing that we realize is about performance. A lot of papers publish amazing results about uh, anticipating or detecting um, uh, school student dropout or student performance. But one thing is people try to run those models, or sometimes they train a model in a context and try to run in, in, in for real. So try to apply, deploy the model, and the performance is not that good. And that's one thing. People want to, if, if we reach the level that people want to use a technology and the technology does not perform, does not fulfill the expectation, the behavior, the adoption, we, we start the adoption, but then we stop using. So you try three, four times an app. I tell you, this amazing app, you try, doesn't work. Forget about that, you delete the app. So a lot of people try to use the models that are close. And then I did, for example, for school dropout, I did the systematic literature review and I found a lot of papers. But we, one thing that I realized people are doing and publishing something that's really interesting. And I'll just try to share the concept that's something that's interesting, but it's not right. So this school dropout model, what we do is we have historical data about students that finish 
they graduated or the under graduation and students that drop out. And we train a model, machine learning model, to do the classification of new students. We get the new students to just show if the student is more prone to drop out or more prone to uh, finish. And we can calculate the accuracy of the model. And usually what we do is we split our historical data into two parts. One part we use to train the model, like the exercise we give to the students to prepare for the final exam. And the other part, the data it never saw before, we use to validate the model. We have the ground truth. We compare the prediction the model did to the ground truth, and we can count that and the percentage or the, the, the ratio of the mistakes are actually it did right, we say that's the accuracy. So if I tell you I have distinct data sets and I train three models, and one model gave me 75% accuracy, the other one gave 85% accuracy, and the last one gave me 95% accuracy. We believe that the best model is the one that's 95% accuracy. And many published papers tell them. But there is one thing they forgot. It depends on how balanced is the data set. So if you have a data set with half the data set is people that drop out and half did not drop out, and you use that data set to test with that, then it means something different, the 75%. In this example here, let's suppose I have the second data set is 85%, 15%. 15% of the students dropped out. Usually, uh, a minor part of the students drop down. So the data set, this kind of data set for education is highly unbalanced or imbalanced. The other example here, only 5% drop out. So what the models did here, it looks like they are amazing, but they are not. And that's why most of the experience were not successful. Because in fact, the model learns how we learn. Let's suppose you have a final exam and everyone tells you that the professor is used to ask you 10 multiple choice questions. And at least 8% of those questions, the alternative will be C. That's, see, if you know that, you don't need to learn the content. You go there and put C on everything and you get like H of 10. The model learns that. The model is smart. If it knows that there is a major class, so people do not drop out, he will have, he will show you, for example, 95% accuracy because he probably guessed that no one will drop out, only two or three guys. So in practical terms, it doesn't work. And people have been publishing that. So recently, people will start to balance the data set. And this is documented in many <clears throat> authors said, oh, this is wrong. And people have been, this gives you the false sensation that you can predict correctly speed drop out. In fact, you can predict, but that's not the right thing. So one of the work I, I developed is like I try to improve that. And despite of the knowledge of balance the data set, I, I wanted to create a machine learning technique, a new type of a neural network that could improve that automatically. So it should be, it would it needed to be able to learn and really learn and not guess based on a data set that's not balancing. I just published recently, I used a 10 year data set from a university in Portugal, uh, from two undergraduate course. Uh, one of the class that dropped out is, represents 32% of the data set with more than 4,400 students. And we got 32 features or variables, demographic data, socioeconomic data, and academic factors. And I will not go deep into the details, but what we did, uh, first stage, I use the regular uh, neural network training to see what's the best I can do without balancing the data set. And the second stage, I the technique I proposed, kick it in, got the neural network, and did an optimization. We used a second order optimization that used the second order derivative. I, I can talk offline about the details, but the thing here is we basically not only adjusted the waves, but also we adjust all the activation functions parameters that can enhance the knowledge. And that the, the and how we got that idea is based on a biological factor because we realized that the activation function of the neurons of rats, at least in some parts of the brain, 
they are they have different shapes. But the thing here is we compared both. So if we don't balance the data set, we have 72% accuracy. But that's probably when you see the data, it, it's guessing because 32%, 70%, around 70% is people that will not do drop out. When we apply the technique, we get almost 92% accuracy. That's real accuracy. That means that the algorithm is learning now, despite the fact that no one balanced the data set. Why we did that? Because we cannot expect that people will get their data and think about balance the data set. This should be automatic. If you want people to use, it should be three clicks and it's done, and then you can predict. So considering that the, 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 as a baseline, the 72%, it represents 27% improvement. How another research is on in, 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 enhancing facilitating conditions. So one of the things that uh, made me sad when I tried to do things in Brazil is like, oh, we don't have money, we don't have resource. But there is one thing, we lost the track about how to use computer very well. We don't need that much resource. We don't need too much computer power to do amazing things with artificial intelligence. And I talked to some professors and they said, oh, there's not too much you can do. But since I learned in those small machines how to code and the approach we use in the past is different. So we didn't have those frameworks that are heavy, but helps you to make things easier. I imposed myself a challenge to make a very good artificial neural network to run on a device that's used, it's cheap, and you use it uh, uh, highly ad adopted. Uh, the microcontroller can be found costing one cent to 10 cents in large scale in China. And people use Arduino, it's an open source platform. I want to create a library that helps them to use AI on something that's very cheap, it's very powerful, and if I create something that's light enough to run on Arduino, when I put that to run in the cloud, the billing will drop a lot because people put those solutions to a scale, large scale. I remember when I worked for Samsung, we bought a new startup and they built, they built something to run on the cloud. But once we, 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 we reach 2 million users, the check we need to write every month to Amazon was too high. So large scale means large scale money. So, and although cloud does not cost too much, it does not cost too much for you, but when you scale to millions of people, it's a lot of money. So I want to, I pushed myself to develop something that can run here. Nice AI that run on something that's cheap. And it, it can easy, even assume the form factor of something that can be on any device, any wearable. And it was done. So the result, I can share the paper and I can discuss later how we did that. Uh, we run running an AI to recognize characters on a six shaped beach microcontroller or microcomputer uh, reached a 71% accuracy. You can do better, yes, but I need to run on a small neural network because otherwise I could not port on a tiny device. So I compared what I can do here with more precision, 6 shade bit precision, and what I can do on Arduino that the microcontroller can cost one to 10 cents in large scale. I could reach, I could recognize characters and image um, in eight, 6% of the case. So that means something that's very tiny, does not uh, spend that much energy, does not cost that much, can do something powerful. So that reduced the barrier. The other thing about AI is we are building huge models. You know how much carbon footprint does it cost to build a language model, a huge language model? It costs the same of five cars running for the whole lifetime burning fossil fuel. That's what one neural network costs. In the next years, you'll hear a lot about against neural networks because they are not environmentally friendly. This is very tiny and runs on battery. And the funny thing here is, it's news. <laughs> the memory footprint, the code run on less than 10 kilobytes because Arduino has 28 kilobytes. And the run memory run on runtime was less than 3.5 kilobytes. So we can do, we don't need to spend that much money. So when we deploy in Brazil, they say, oh, there's too much. No, it's very cheap to run good AI if you do well. 
what that means in terms of kilobytes. Well, if you open a Word document, write hello and save, that is probably you cannot see here, but that's 12 kilobytes. So writing hello and saving is 12 kilobytes. So we can run for a few things left. Moving towards an end. The last thing we did is trying to put all those components in something that reduce the effort expectation and improve the facilitation conditions as well. I like, and I put this picture because there is a very good book from Don Norman about affordance, about the design of everyday things. I highly recommend if you never read that, but probably you guys read. Uh, and I like the example that he always put that example of the shower. And I remember first time I, I, I came to the US, I couldn't open the shower, uh, the bathtub, and I felt myself stupid. And then when I read the book, he described that example. He said, you are not stupid. The stupid is the designer. I said, okay, well, I feel better now <laughs> because it took me a while and it took calls. How I change this? So things should be easy to use. And the concept of affordance is basically the property that a technology should have that basically is almost like it express itself how to use. So users that should look at the first time and realize how you use them or extract or you do the use case you are going to do. If you want to run serious AI on a universe organizations you want to deploy, you need to consider many things on your stack. This is an old map of solutions that you combine to run AI in a serious environment, running every day reliably. And then, in my opinion, things should be like this. I'm not creating anything, I'm just copying what Apple did. I, if you have ever opened an iPhone, if you have an old iPhone, open it. It's amazing. A lot of time piece, amazing engineering, very complex. This is the hidden side. But if you see the user side, only one, two or three buttons, everything simple. Any kid learn how to do that. So this is what we did. Um, doing research, we realized if I put a new tool on the desk of an executive or someone in universe, they will never use it. But everyone uses Excel. So I should be able to give them AI that can, they can create with few clicks. Because the problem of creating a model here in US and deploying Brazil or the creating Northeast of Brazil and deploying South, the accuracy will be low. The environment change, variables change. So here, what we did is basically, I'll play the video here. Okay. And uh, if you have any data set, you, you basically put the name of the model, you select uh, the columns that are your independent variables that you use to predict. And then you go to the other column, select your target variable, easy like that. And then you say, I want you to create the number of models you want. Uh, if it's a classification model or a regression type, and it sends to the cloud, so very light and on the cloud, it use automatic machine learning to do everything that needs to be done to create the model. And then in few minutes, it create one model, you can create many with 92% accuracy. And then basically you can say publish that model. Once you did that, everyone in the organization can see the model. And everyone that can you can has Excel is using AI. You don't need to teach to code. You don't need to teach a lot of things. Because people, you just have now a model to predict things. So how will you use that? After you publish, let's move to the next slide. Let's dismiss this. So basically, we have here data that has not never. Okay. So now I'm selecting new data, although I have the ground truth. I'll not send you the model the ground truth. I'll just say, model, please tell me what will be the performance of each student. Each line has a student data. Tell me what the student, how the student will perform. If you pass or you fail. And then we send it sent to the cloud. It runs the model there and we'll give the answer. That's, it creates a new tab with the data and the answer. I'm just going to copy here the, the fields of my ground truth to compare. That's the answer the model gave. 
The one that has colors is the ground truth. And then we just put a formula to see if the model did it right or wrong. And, uh, and basically, if you see only two situations, uh, it made a mistake. Um, so this is how easy AI is becoming. And uh, I'm testing some companies and I'm starting to test in educational institutions. So anyone with a spreadsheet should be able to use this more crystal ball. And if you succeed, it will take a while, but people with one hour of training, it can do AI. It doesn't need to be very complex. All the complexity needs to be hidden. So that following this, we try to hide all the complexity and create something simple. And um, what we have done here, I um, promise I'm going to finish. <laughs> Um, we based on the framework we found, I we worked to reduce how much it costs. Um, the integration of tool already adopted, putting a new tool or nowadays the cost of acquisition of a new customer is pretty high. But if you create something that's actually to install, that thing is really easy. You just add it's an add-on, it boom, it's installed. So it's integrated with a tool that's already existed. That's what I realized is important. Uh, the infrastructure is very simple to try. It actually is complex on the side that they don't need to see. But if you go to a school and say, you need to have this computer, have to forget, they will not do that. Uh, the performance, we improve the learning performance a lot. We reduce the impact of the data set. It's a big thing to have a good data set. We did some approach to uh, reduce the impact of unbalanced data set. We don't, we cannot ask, a teacher, a professor to work on the balance. Uh, and we basically leverage on a red known interface. We try to do few clicks. The newer version is less click. You don't need to go on this side. You basically select, do, click on a, a button and select the other column and then do it, it. So we reduce the number of clicks and it's codeless. Few takeaways so we can discuss. In my opinion, technologies are not always used the way they are intended. And that doing research, it looks like we have some evidence. The best use cases are not obvious. It's very hard and sometimes take a while to find the sweetest spot on how you leverage correctly on that technology. Solutions and policies are sometimes designed on ideal concepts that we have. But uh, the way people will use that technology is basically the way we be they believe they should use. Maybe it's just to play game. Maybe it's to uh, uh, predict who is going to date someone. Maybe that's how they use AI. I don't know. Top-down approaches are to his risk, and we have been doing that. We say that's how they should use, and they try. We try to push with the throw. And I don't believe that. I think the the the, the gaming industry, many industries, touch us how we should proceed. Uh, adoption models, in my opinion, can help us to uncover that hidden factors that help to adopt, and the uncovered factors can support, in my opinion, a better solution, better policy designs, and that may contribute to reduce attrition on adoption. Those models that we create, you can put data, and you can also say how I can maximize this variable. And it gives you the variables you should tackle. So you can use that as a simulation. When you create a policy, that example, the AI workbench, that's the name of the tool, you create models and then you can simulate the results of policy. And then you can try to predict the outcome of new policy before you spend money and time and you don't have too much maneuver margin. So thank you. I would like now to hear a little bit. I'm tired. <laughs>